We're doing this presentation for an eighth grade class, just to let you know. Not ninth grade, ninth grade science class. Any high school science. High, high school, school science. science. Hello, my name is Josh Papendorf, and I'm studying electrical engineering. I'll probably be going to Tennessee Tech. I'm Tate Mauser, uh, majoring in mechanical engineering, studying here at Columbia State currently. Hey guys, my name is Ramon Polizarro. I'm a mechanical engineering student here at Columbia State, and I'll be transferring to Tennessee Tech next fall. So our presentation is on STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. It can be, as you've heard, very, very challenging, but it's also very rewarding to once you accomplish it. They have some very good paying jobs and very fun jobs uh, once you get into it. Well, what is STEM? They said science, technology, engineering, math, hard work that pays off. And the main branches of that are mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Well, what, what, what about mathematics? You won't really see any applications of mathematics until you go to college or even grad school. But some of them include number theory, functional analysis, and game theory. Now, number theory, anybody know what that is? Anybody ever heard of it? Feel free to speak up. Doesn't you do? Well, what's number theory? You're you supposed to tell me. Okay, it's we're we're doing more interactive thing, but I can I can tell you. Well, it's it's the study of numbers really. They they focus on the integers and odd numbers. It's really a that's really the compiled thing. Uh, and the functional analysis they deal with infinite dimensional vector spaces, which you won't really learn about that until probably grad school if you go into mathematics. And game theory, that's a, probably one of the most interesting things in studying mathematics at the very high level up. What it is, it's the study of determining what people will do at a certain situation, like what choices they will make and stuff like that. It's, it comes into games, it's for the economy. It's used mostly probably the military. I mean. Right, military, mm -hmm. warfare a lot, um, stuff like that. What's that? Commerce. Commerce? Pretty much everything. Uh, right now all you're doing in mathematics is really uh, getting the equation and setting it equal to each other, but the higher up you go, the more you see how it applies to everything. It really becomes really interesting, but you got to put in the work before that. Now physics, anybody know anything about forces? It's a broad question, can anybody tell me anything about forces? I got free candy for those who answer questions. <laughs> no? Okay, well forces are, that's pretty much what physics is, it's just the study of forces, really a general uh, generalization of it. And like for every force is an equal and opposite reaction. When you push somebody, they're gonna fall over and they're gonna push against you. I'm not gonna go into that, it's not what our presentation is about, but you can go to YouTube and really learn a lot before you get to the actual courses that you take. And it is because of our understanding of forces that we can build things such as rockets and fast cars and everything like that. Now for chemistry, it's it's pretty amazing the things we've we've been able to create because of our knowledge of chemistry. Things such as medicine, we play around with the atomic structure of things to create medicine so you can feel better when you get sick. We can also mess around with petroleum to create things such as gasoline or oil or, yeah, or anything in between. Uh, it's because of our knowledge of this branch that we can have so many of the things that we have. All right, next slide please. And next up, we have the engineering, the computer coding, and robotics. For engineering, you guys know you drive or you ride the buses or cars, anything you do when you see a bridge. That's the engineer that designed it, uh, roads, anything like that. It really has a lot of applications. That's pretty much what the field is. You use all the science and the technology and the mathematics, and you combine it into stuff that you can build to make people's lives better. And robotics, they have some awesome robots coming out. Like they have tuna fish robots that can swim through the water, and they have snakes that can climb up trees, and dogs that can carry 400 pounds. Just robotic things. It's at the infant stage right now. So if it's something that you find interesting, you can really get into it, and it's a really, really good field to get into. And computer coding, when you play the video games, it's all codes that go inside that. 
uh, it's like a list of commands. It's, it's pretty complex. It's another completely different language, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty fun. You can even make your own games. When you go to Flash games or really simple games, you can make those of our own. So now, now you guys know a little bit more about what STEM is and our project, uh, Tate will now talk about. So we're scoping in a little further into uh, one of the great um, applications of physics, uh, Stirling, the Stirling engine. So a Stirling engine is basically a device capable of converting thermal energy into mechanical energy for uh, for everyday use. Uh, you could use it for generators or to run a car, anything like that. Um, here you see the, the, main, the basic components of a beta style Stirling engine. You've got the flywheel right here that basically is just there to retain momentum while the, the cycle is in motion. You've got the crankshaft somewhere in here that basically times what, when the pistons do what, um, the movement of the pistons. In, in the beta style engine, you can see there's a 90 degree angle between the two piston arms. Um, this area right in here, we have the pressure vessel where all the heating, cooling, uh, change of volume, change of pressure is going on. You've also, you've got the power piston right here, which is essentially the change in volume is what essentially powers the Stirling engine. You also have enough, another piston, the displacer, but if you notice, there's a gap between the displacer and the walls of the pressure vessel. It's not supposed to be airtight. Essentially, it just moves up and down, displacing the gas or working fluid within the pressure vessel, moving it from the heat source to the cooling source. So, under steam motion. Uh, what are some of the advantages of the Stern engine? They're very tall uh, as for candy. For candy. <laughs> so we've got the fact that compared to uh, com uh, like a regular combustion engine like your car runs off of, it's a lot quieter when it runs. Um, that'd be great if you're putting it into a car that doesn't have a radio. You know? <laughs> um, Compared to steam engines, steam engines build up lots of pressure, and then they have a valve that releases that pressure, and if that valve fails, uh, they have been known to build up enough pressure to explode. Stirling engine doesn't build up that much pressure, and it doesn't ever release it, so there's no potential explosion possibilities there. Also, there's vast fueling options for a Stirling engine. Because, because it runs on heat, you could power it by the sun, uh, the whole, or volcano. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, even waste heat from like a factory that has some chemical process going on that emits heat that's wasted. Um, and it, it doesn't give off any exhaust, so it doesn't create any pollution. So it's environmentally friendly. So here we have a qualitative graph representing the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature during the four stages of the Stirling cycle. Stage one, the power piston goes up, exp uh, increasing volume and decreasing pressure. Step two, the displacer drops, forcing the air to go from the heat source to the cooling source and causes an even further drop in pressure. And then you've got stage three where the power piston goes back down, causing a decrease in pressure and an increase, I mean, sorry, an in, a decrease in volume and an increase in pressure. And then stage four, the displacer is raised and the working fluid is allowed to drop back down to the bottom where it is heated again. Uh, now I'll time to turn the time over to Josh, who will talk to you about our Stirling engine. Okay, so the materials needed, this is kind of a general list here of materials needed to build uh, a Stirling engine or heat engine at home with household items. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's that simple or that easy, but 
Um, it's pretty much what you'll see on the on the internet and resources out there. Or, you know, people using containers, Coke cans. Um, so basically, yeah. Go to the next slide. Okay, so you want to zoom in right here for me? So right here, this is our first build, our first concept. Um, it's not going to be what you will see today. We have a newer one, but this is the first generation, kind of first phases. We've got a pint size uh, monster here in a Coke can. This, and within here, you're going to have the displacer, which is, uh, I always forget, it's brass. Steel uh, wool. Steel wool. Steel wool on a fishing line. And it will be pulled up by the crankshaft you see right here. These were actually um, take. These were from the electrical piece. From what was that again? Do you remember? Some sort of electrical <coughs> connector box. We just ripped it open and pulled them all up. Yeah. Them. Yeah. And, and so that worked really well right here for uh, a, a less friction um, movement with the crankshaft pulling the displacer up. And rotating the um, the uh, flywheel. Would you, you back out so I can show the flywheel? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Got a slide for me. <clears throat> so right there, you can see um, the heat source right there. Candles. We've got a little stand here to hold it, um, and then we got the the flywheel here. And the idea there is. Um, to, to continue the mechanical energy, to, to, to get it to work with you. Um, and that takes up positioning of, of weight correctly uh, on, the, on the fly. So, okay, so when you don't have blueprints, you don't have a technical outline for something like this, it's really hard to know where your problems are. And so a lot of times we would um, rebuild it and some components could have been working correctly and others may not have been. So it, it, you can have a real struggle there. Um, it's not as easy and quick as people on the internet and their little videos <laughs> make it out to be. Um, it's actually, there's a lot of sources of friction. <clears throat> yeah, and those are uh, resistive forces that don't work with the flow of your machine. Those are bad. So. Hey guys, so that's pretty much it. Uh, we're going to kind of warm up the Sterling engine right now. We'll unveil it when it's warmed up. It's the final project. It is ready. Yeah, it took us quite a bit to to get it, you know, the finalized order. The flywheel, it keeps the momentum going. So the, the crankshaft moves the balloon up. And to bring it back down and spin the circle, you got to have the flywheel to provide some momentum. So it's been heating up at the bottom for a couple minutes now. I'm going to add ice cold water around the, in this little tuna can right here, it's, the, it's a jacket that kind of holds the cold water up against the top of the pressure vessel, which is this bottom can right here. And then you've got the flywheel, the crunch up, and all that. Yeah, the more extreme the temperature differences are, the better the, the heat engine will work. It, ex it works uh, on the basis of expanding and contracting the gas that's inside the just gets air. Don't worry, it's JB Weld. Nothing's going to get in the can. <laughs> Trying to get in, get it to work. Any questions about the design and the presentation or anything in general? Yes, ma'am. Could you show me the diagram, the animated diagram? I don't know if you can slow it down at all, but point out the little little various little. bits of what's happening in the, the stages of the stirring cycle. Right.
Okay, so we have the, we can't really slow this down. Ours uh, just has kind of this is the balloon, right? It's, it's attached to the top, and we have the crankshaft that pulls it up and down. So the principle of but the it's design. it's not a flywheel. That's got the flywheel. That doesn't even have a flywheel. I guess it's included. Right. So we have the heat source. And once you heat anything, the particles get all excited and they want to expand, right? Get away from each other. So that's what that is. For this, we have that steel wool. We kind of wrapped it around the line and it goes up and down. Okay, so right? you're so telling it's, me that the, the candles heat the material in the... They heat the air, the air, the air, the air, air right. and push up the piston. It causes an expanse and an increase in volume, and then, and then the cold condenses, and, and then it decreases in volume. So right. there's almost a suction going on, I would imagine, a pushing and a suction. <clears throat> and it's that continuous motion, so we have the flywheel to keep the momentum up and keep the cycle going, so that continuous motion keeps, keeps it hopefully uh, going. So you're saying that the energy is stored in the, the motion of the flywheel, right. which is then converted for the next cycle it gives of it. the sterling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gives it just enough to get over the hill and, and do it again and again, as long as there's a heat source. Well, the more the more adequate the, the system, right, if you have a piston instead of just the steel wool displacer, if you have a machine shop and the correct parts and everything to work with, you can make a very, very, they have some Sterling engines that run the, off of the heat of your hand. That's yeah, how, coffee cups. right, co yeah, you put it on top of a coffee cup and it runs. They have some thermal ones that run on the solar energy, which is pretty amazing, you know? It, uh, it'll heat up the top of it and the bottom is underground where it's kind of cold, and that heat difference will cause it to span a windmill or whatever you want. And you said yours has a balloon. What? Is yeah, this, that that part right there, that piston right there, is the is our balloon. And they're not on the same crank. I mean, they're not attached to the flywheel. We have a separate flywheel. This is a simplified, more efficient way of doing it. <clears throat> and there's there's other there's a there's an alpha model. Which separates the chambers completely. It right. just has lines that run to each other. We have a fishing wire which is attached to this part of the crankshaft, and every time it goes up, it brings the displacer up, right? So every time it goes, and then it goes down, and it brings it down. This right here is coiled around a screw that has a hole in it. Fishing line goes through the screw hole and is attached to the displacer. Okay. And so this um, piece of metal coiled around this screw is attached right there and there, the two points right there. So that pulls the balloon up, displacer's down, vice versa. Same thing as the other model, except um, not as Ours is cooler. <laughs> If it'll, if it'll get going. Any other questions? <laughs> when you've gotten this working in the past, uh, how long will it? It, run. It, it went indefinitely, but at a very slow speed, you know, it, it'll, it would keep going until we <coughs> finally took the heat source off, but it's not a very reliable source, it's kind of the beta steps right now, you know. But the thing we learned is, is that every time you, you said to work in an engine or anything that has any moving parts, it will be so much more complicated than you expect. You kind of have to troubleshoot, and you have to figure out what went wrong with it and try to fix that, and, and then what went wrong with it, right. And there's not a certain set of, there's no certain way to know that what you fixed last time was wrong, you know? So that's, that's one of the problems we ran into with this. 
the simpler you can design things like that, I would think the better. The less moving parts, the less unknowns. <clears throat> oh, it turned over. All right, that, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> we're out. We're out. We're leaving on a high note. <laughs> no, we need to work. It's probably because I'm over here. I'm bad in love. Can any one of your team suggest what the difficulty is with trying to get it to start? Well, the thing is, just getting the, the heat. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I'm doing right now is I'm just pouring the water back into that ice water so that it can get cold again. Because uh, if, if this warms up from the heat down here, it's hard to keep... To, to Ideally, we, we could have something to separate the heat, to keep the heat from reaching and that would be an yeah. alpha model. <clears throat> D, our cold water bath right here. But... There you go! <laughs> it's amazing how much um, rotational you know, force and things that are required just to generate enough electricity. Right, so what we learned in physics, you know, we could spend all day talking about the normal forces against the table. Um, I'm just talking in general now, you know, we're, we're kind of done with the presentation at this point. But speaking to you guys as physics students, uh, you have angular momentum going, uh, thermodynamic, Energy, which we haven't learned yet, so we're not going to speak of that. Uh, mechanical motion, we have thermal energy that's converting thermal into mechanical and doing work because of that. Yeah. You want to see how closer you can come up? Mm -hmm. Don't get too close, it'll stop working. <laughs> Where did you get the idea for that? Ramon. It was his idea. I was wanting to do a steam engine, and he researched Stirling engines. And with a Stirling engine, again, you don't have to deal with pressure and priming it up, the pressure and things like that. So I still think the steam one might have been a little easier, but whatever. Just more dangerous. The pressure one was a little. The steam one. Yeah. Put an ice cube in it. Yeah, if you cool it off more, it should go a little faster. But you have no room there. Yeah, we don't. We should have made it wider so that we could. We first last you. So you build one of these, you got yourself a little homemade fan in the summertime. <laughs> cool you off. Maybe. They keep coming off the engine fan. Kind of warm you up. <laughs> Alright, well, is that... If there are no questions, we'll close our presentation and... Thank <laughs> you.